Maria Konnikova, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. So great to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Rufus. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on the selection of The Biggest Bluff as one of our two summer books. As you know, it, this is, you know, Adam Grant, Malcolm Gladwell, Susan Cain, Dan Pink selecting the two best books of the season, which is, I think, quite an extraordinary distinction. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you. I feel very honored. Well, you've written a book about risk told through the lens of poker, and the writing of the book itself strikes me as, as something that was a meaningful risk for you, right? I mean, it, was a, it was a gambit. Um, you took a year out of your life. You distressed your grandmother. Um, uh, and you crashed this very male-dominated, insular world of, of, of poker. Uh, so a, book, a risky book about risk, although right now, uh, it doesn't feel so risky, I imagine. This is exactly right. Um, and it ended up being more than a year, even though I thought it was just going to be a year. So it ended up being um, a really huge departure for me. And at the beginning, I think it's really important to note that I didn't know anything about poker, zero. And so I also didn't know if I was going to be any good at it. I didn't know at all what was going to happen with this journey. I had no expectations. A lot of people ask me, you know, were you, were you planning to be, you know, were you going to work hard to win something? No, I mean, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to play at any sort of decent level. And I also didn't know if I'd enjoy the game, if it's something that I would come to feel strongly about one way or the other. I did know that I had a really nice thing going at the New Yorker and that, you know, I that I'd been writing articles that people had liked and that if I did this, a lot of people warned me that I shouldn't do it because my name would be out of the limelight. No one people will forget about you. A lot of writer friends said, what are you doing? And as you said, my my uh, grandmother was not entirely happy with this choice either. So it was definitely one of the riskiest things I've done in terms of in terms of my career because i just kind of put everything on hold and decided you know what i'm going to i'm going to try this i'm going to see if it happens and the book is a total departure for me i am not a first person author i no. am someone who reports about other people and who writes mm. about other people i don't write about myself and this was going to be a memoir and it was going to be the most personal thing that i'd ever done and mm. so i was i was terrified that people wouldn't like my voice, that they wouldn't like hearing me and not journalist me, but actual me, the actual stuff that happens inside my head. So it was scary on every single level. And that's why I knew it was the right thing to do, because I, I think that that's a really good sign mm. that you're doing something that's going to challenge you, that's mm -hmm. going to force you to flex your creative muscles in a new way. I don't want to keep writing the same book over and over. I don't want to keep writing the mm. same article over and over. I want to grow. I want to challenge myself. I want to become a bigger person and I want my brain to become bigger and better. And so being terrified was terrifying, but it also made me realize that this was something that I should do. Well, I have to say it was even intimidating vicariously reading the book in places <laughs> like quite, quite uh, it, was, it was wonderful. And, and it, it must have been at the outset you know, that's somewhat of it. We, we know that like, you know, uh, there are, um, you know, documentaries like Supersize Me. There, there, there are a lot of books in which people stick out their necks and, and there's a, there's a ganjo journalism kind of, um, uh, appeal, right. To, to, to authors taking these kinds of risks. But I, I, you get the sense of reading the book that you really, I mean, nobody could have guessed, right. That you would end up becoming a, a, a top professional poker player, you ended up winning over three hundred thousand dollars in prizes. I mean, ha had had I told you this, you know, in in the early weeks of your embarking on this, I, you probably would have fallen out of your chair. I mean, you 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 had no idea that you it was going to have this kind of outcome. Absolutely not, and I couldn't have had any idea. And the first thing, it's funny. So I approached one of the best players in the world, Eric Seidel, to coach me because. 
I don't know anything about poker or I didn't at the time, but I do know something about learning. Um, and I know that one of the best ways to learn is to find a mentor, find someone who's really, really good at the thing you want to learn and let them teach you. Follow them, see what they do, just be a fly on the wall. And that's something that I'm good at doing. And so I had approached Eric Seidel and asked him to take me on. And in our initial conversations, he made it very clear that I wasn't supposed to have any expectations. He said, you know, you have a theoretically a good background for this. He liked that I was trained in psychology, that I'd studied decision making, that I'd studied self-control. He said, these are things that are going to be very, very useful at the poker table. But until you sit down, until you, you are subjected to the pressure, until you actually have to perform, we don't know if you're going to be able to think in that way, in that environment. We don't know if you're going to be any good at this because it's very difficult to predict. He said, you have some of the building blocks there, sure, but you can't go into it thinking I'm going to be good. You have to go into it with an open mind, just saying, I'm going to try my best and I'm going to see if I can just think clearly and think well. And if I've done that, then I've succeeded, even if I haven't necessarily succeeded as a player. Well, and, and that was really your, your first bit of luck, wasn't it? To get the legendary Eric Seidel to, you know, who, 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 who doesn't often share his secrets, right? To actually take you on to this degree. I mean, talk about luck and pluck. I love that. I love that you, you quote E.B. White as saying, we need to be honest about the ratio of pluck and luck in your life. But, but this took both pluck for you to look, you know, reach out to him and, and, and a decent amount of luck that he actually engaged with you, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I got hugely lucky. I don't think, I mean, the book would have existed. It just would have been a very, very different book. I think a worse book. And I probably wouldn't have had the success I had if Eric had said no. And if I'd had to no. figure out who else I was going to work with. The, the pluck part was easier than expected because I'm a journalist. Um, no, and so no. I'm really used to reaching out to brilliant people who are at the top of their field and who are just very intimidating in every single way. And I can just hide behind the New Yorker or wherever I'm writing for yeah, and sure, say, sure. hi, I'm just, I'm writing for some other publications. So please, um, please indulge me. And so I'm used to cold calling people. That yeah. said, um, here, I wasn't doing it for an article and I hadn't even sold the book. I needed Eric on board before I could uh, sell the book. And so it was much more speculative. And it was me approaching him saying, um, I have this idea and I don't know if it's going to work and I don't know if I'm going to be able to sell it, but I want to do it. Um, will you let me into your life? Will you let me tag him along with you for a year? And that's a huge ask, even of someone who's very open. And Eric is such a shy person. And he does not like to share what he does. I mean, he was notorious back in the early days of televised poker when you could sit, when you could see people's whole cards. He was notorious for not showing his. He did not want to give anything away. He just refused yeah. to put them in the in front of the readers so that the camera could see them, because he didn't care if he never got invited back. He didn't care if he was on TV or not. He's someone who just never cared about the limelight. Had I known the extent to which this was true, I probably would have been much more intimidated um, than, than I was going in because I would have known how little probability I had of success. But what I did do is prepare. And I wanted to show him that, sure, I wasn't a poker player, but I was willing to work really, really hard. And I would try to make it worth his while, both in terms of my own energy and both and to have it be a two way street, not just me getting things from him, but sharing things with him. And so I came prepared with psych studies. I actually did ho my homework. I did some research. I came with printouts of studies that I'd read um, about the poker world that had never actually made it out of academia to, to give him so that I could show him that I had some added value as well. It was part of part of your wooing process. That went well, well, well played. Well, so let's talk about how, how you how you arrived at this project because it wasn't so much an interest in poker, right? That that got you in as much as it was an interest in in the role that that luck plays in our lives. And and you open early in the book, you tell us about the, how challenging the year two thousand fifteen was for you and your family. Yes, um, so I think it's an understatement to say that I didn't come to poker from any love of the game. I mean, I really had never played poker. And 
didn't like games. I still don't like games. I'm not a games player. I didn't have a deck of cards growing up. I mean, I literally didn't know how many cards were in a deck when I first met Eric. And I never cared. And I didn't play chess. And I didn't play, you know, checkers. And didn't play computer games. And that's very, very different from the typical poker player. Most poker yeah. players come to poker because someone in their family plays or because they played Magic the Gathering or or something else. They like the gaming world. For me, as, as you mentioned, it was much more about what poker could teach me about chance and about skill. And the reason that I had started wondering about it was because I had had a really bad year, which started off um, with me just having a really big health scare, some sort of autoimmune condition that to this day has not been diagnosed. I just had blood readings that were off the charts with all sorts of hormone levels and became allergic to everything. I normally have allergies in terms of respiratory allergies. You know, I have seasonal allergies. I'm allergic to all animals. If you have a cat, I'll never be able to come to your house. I have an EpiPen yeah, for cats. Yeah. Um, but but um, I was never, my skin was never allergic to that many things. It was sensitive, but it was fine. Yeah. And all of a sudden it would react in just huge hives when anything touched it. And I mean anything. And so there were months where I couldn't go outside because my body was just covered in these painful welts. And I went to everyone and all of the leading specialists and no one knew what it was. And they kept saying it's idiopathic, which means of unknown origin. Um, we don't know. And this was, it was difficult enough to deal with on its own, but around the same time, my grandmother died and she didn't die from an illness. She died of just a freak accident. She was living by herself, completely independent, strong, healthy, and slipped in the middle of the night when she was going to the bathroom and hit her head um, and didn't wake up. And so it was very sudden and it made me really just pause all of these things happening at once. My mom lost her job, my husband lost his job, just all of these dominoes, one after the other, totally unrelated. And it made me realize that we just take so many things for granted that we often just think, oh, you know, I'm working hard. And so, of course, I'm, you know, I'm doing well. I'm able to survive. I'm able to pay my bills because I work hard. And so I deserve this. I deserve to have all of this stuff. And that's just not true. I mean, hard work is important and hard. You need to work hard, but that ain't enough. <laughs> you need to you need to have the skill, but you also need to have chance on your side. You need to be lucky, you know, and that's not something that we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Unless things start going wrong, that's when you really start thinking about it. So I wanted to write about this. I, I wanted to explore it. And poker actually came up because I started reading about game theory and learned that John von Neumann, the father of game theory, was a poker player. And that not only was he a poker player, but that poker was actually the inspiration for game theory. That he thought that being able to understand and to solve this game would give him a window into the human mind, into strategic decision-making on the highest levels, and that it would really deal with a lot of these questions that I had. And so when I, when I read that, when I read that, I also loved that he didn't like games. He, he, was, a, he was a man after my own heart. He loved poker, but not other games. <laughs> And, and because, he wasn't very good at poker either, I think you no, said. No, he was not very good at poker. Yeah. Actually, someone yeah. challenged me on that. Not challenged like, oh, I found evidence to the contrary, but said, really? Like someone as brilliant as John von Neumann wasn't good at poker? It made me realize mm. maybe he just pretended, maybe it was more fun for him to not be good at poker. Yeah. I have no idea. All the accounts are of him being a terrible player. He definitely was a losing player at poker. But it made me wonder, was he really incapable of winning or did he not want to because he enjoyed Kind of, he enjoyed the stories. He enjoyed the banter. He enjoyed being known as a bad poker player. Makes you wonder. <laughs> I I had no idea about that history of game theory and John von Neumann's interest in poker. Uh, and you write um, to him. It, I'm going to say, start that again. You write to him. It represented the ineffable balance between skill and chance that governs life. So he he, he not only identified it as being a, a you know. Uh, something that something that would that, that would inspire the whole theory of game theory, but it also, but but he saw this as as perhaps the game that was most closely matched with the um, the challenge of kind of navigating our lives. Absolutely. In fact, I'll go even further. He thought that understanding poker, solving poker, would prevent nuclear war. 
he actually thought that if you learned to think that way, that it would help at the very, very highest levels with the most important decisions of all. And the reason for that is that poker is a game of incomplete information exactly the way that life is. So there are knowns and unknowns. There are things that I know, but that only I know. You don't know them. There are things that only you know, Mm -hmm. and I don't know them. And then we can start guessing at what the other person knows. And of course, there's the information that we both have. And it's this iterative process. It's this game of people. It's a game of probabilities. It's a game of uncertainty where your goal is to make the best decision possible, but you know that it's never going to be necessarily leading you to the outcome that you want because chance is involved. So you can, your goal is to get the probabilities to, on your side as much as possible, put yourself in a position to win, make the right decision, but the outcome is out of your hands. You don't control the cards. You don't know what's dealt. And that's what, that's, a perfect analog for life where you can do everything right, but chance also Mm. has to go your way. And so in life, nothing is 100% certain. There is no decision that you will ever make where you will know the outcome with 100% certainty, even if you cheat. So this was a, this was an interesting thing that the father of probability Cardano, um, who I write about in the book was also a poker player um, and a card player and has what, I mean, poker didn't exist then, but he has what, people think might be the earliest description Mm -hmm. of the game that would become poker. And he, he actually despaired. He said, I'm, he he basically, he discovered probability in order to win at cards and to be able to beat people. Um, And he was pretty successful, but then he said, my theories are useless. They have no practical value because Mm. I still can't guarantee that I'm going to win. Um, And he said, the only way to guarantee that I'm going to win is to cheat is to actually rig the deck (laughs) and play with a marked deck. That's the only way to guarantee success. But in life, even if you rig the deck, um, still not 100% certain. Absolutely right. Well, and and, and there's a bias. I mean, I have, for instance, I, I have three boys and I've, uh, and I like to play chess with them and and I've always loved the game of chess. Um, and, and, and I have to admit, Prior to reading your book, I, I had a little bit of what I think would be a conventional bias that, like, I would think of backgammon as somewhat of a lesser game because it was sort of, oh, you, you're introducing this this kind of random dice roll uh, probability. But, but but then what one realizes is, is that is that is that luck is in fact probability that that when you study luck, it it, it what what it looks like is probability that can be understood, and I can I can make a move on a backgammon set and calculate the probability that that you'll hit my piece. Uh, and running those kinds of analyses is closer, as you say, to how life works. Uh, and and um, so I've I, I've really flipped in the course of reading your book my perception of kind of the applicability of of games. And as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, I'm I'm looking forward to teaching my kids Texas Hold'em, which which among the different variants of poker, you 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 say is um, the most. Uh, uh, I guess you'd say that Texas Hold'em is 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 the most applicable. It has the best balance of luck and skill. Is that right? Yes, um, in terms of in terms of mirroring life, yeah. because other variants have either too little or too much unknown. But you're absolutely right that when, in backgammon the dice rolls and in poker the cards of the deck, the random shuffles, what's what's to come. That that is exactly how you model chance. Because luck is a human construct. It's all probability. There is no such thing. Luck is not different from chance, is not different from fate, is not different from any of these things. This is all people putting their own emotional spin on probability. So when we say luck, that's us giving it a valence, positive or negative, good luck, Mm -hmm. bad luck. When we say fate, we're not just giving it a valence, we're giving it a direction. So now mm-hmm. there's there's a directionality to it too. It's all probability. It's all statistics. It's all just numbers. You know. So so this challenging year you had helped to trigger this exploration. But you also write about how you've had an interest in the role that luck plays in our lives for many years. And you 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 write about first feeling um, battling a sense of a of a lack of control as a child. Right. That you first came to the United States. I think perhaps it was in kindergarten. That you had, you know, had had these experiences of not speaking the language and uh, feeling out of place, like you couldn't control what was happening, and you write that you wanted to cry um, 
uh, or, or at the time, you know, you, you feel this, this great frustration about not controlling the, the circumstance, and that you continue to feel that, um, and you have this impulse to cry when you can't control the situation, but crying has become less socially acceptable <laughs> now, now that you're a grown-up, right? But so, so, so you felt this a frustration as a child, and maybe a desire to exert control over an environment that was chaotic for a period of time. Then you had this extraordinary success, right? You were the first in your family to go to, a, uh, to go to college in the United States. You went to Harvard. You got a PhD in psychology from Columbia, specifically studying the psychology of decision-making under conditions of risk and uncertainty, right, which is extraordinary. Then you make it to the top of the writing profession as a regular writer for The New Yorker. Um, and this triggers a desire to, as, as you write, to disentangle just how much of where I'd ended up had been my own doing as opposed to a twist of fate. I wanted to know how much of my life I could take credit for and how much was just stupid luck, right? So, so, so it sounds like this has been like an enduring interest of yours that has culminated in this, in this book. Absolutely. I mean, there was a very, there was something that directly precipitated this journey, but it's definitely, I think this book covers themes that are themes of my life, that are things that I've really wondered for a long time. And, and I do think that it did, you know, the, the realization that I had less control than I wanted happened very early on for me, probably earlier than for a lot of people, because I was thrust into an environment where I couldn't do anything because, as you say, I'd left the Soviet Union. My parents did. They brought me with them. Um, yeah. By the way, luck, right? Insane yeah. luck. Right. Something that I had zero to do with. That is not skill at all. Just like there was no skill in my being born and my being born me with my genes. So from the beginning, we've, sure. we've got that. We've got stack decks for every single person. Um, and then they, they come here, they bring me here and I don't speak English. And so I was so aware from day one, especially because I went into the wrong kindergarten classroom as it ended up, um, which is why I had to start crying. And uh, so I was so aware that our agency is limited and I didn't want it to be. I wanted to be able to do something about it. Crying is doing something, but it's not particularly mm -hmm. effective, but it's still, at least yeah. it's something, right? I think that oftentimes yeah. Yeah. kids cry. Um, if you yeah. think about when infants cry, they yeah. often do it when they're uncomfortable, when they want to communicate something and they, they can't, yeah. they don't have any words. So for them, yeah. that's a means of communication. And so that is something that's very deeply ingrained though in the human mind, our need for control, our need for agency, our need to actually feel like we're in charge of what's happening. And that's both wonderful, but it can also be a liability because we oftentimes think we're a little more in control than we actually are. And we take more credit for our success. And that makes us judgmental. It means we blame people um, who aren't as successful. And we say, oh, mm -hmm. you must have yeah. you must have not worked as hard. Right. And that's right. just wrong. It's completely wrong. Yeah. And and so all of these different tensions were, were things that I'd been wondering for a very long time. And when I was in grad school, I, def I did study decision making and I saw the illusion of control in play, these uh, overconfident people thinking they had more agency than they actually did. Yeah. And I thought, it, it's so funny, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm not, I, I would never fall for the illusion of control because I know, I mean, I've known from the age of four <laughs> that I don't have right, as much right. control as I think. And it was just not true. It was absolutely not true yeah. because obviously, you know, come 2015, I learned that I was just as prone to the illusion of control as other people. Right. And then when that control is taken away, you say, uh-oh. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it's your, your, your humility around your, how lucky you've been is, is so refreshing. I'm always, uh, I, I'm always kind of disappointed when I see wildly successful people interviewed at how infrequently they credit the luck that has resulted in their success, you know, and, and uh, I mean, Warren Buffett is a little better than others when he talks about winning the ovarian lottery, and he speaks to this to some degree. Um, but I love this quote in your book from E.B. White written during World War II. 
The society of movers and doers is a very pompous society indeed, whose members solemnly affect whose members solemnly accept all responsibility for their own eminence and success, <laughs> right? It's just, that's a, like, I mean, you know, you, you don't hear the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world say, you know, I was just trying to create a hot or not app for my college campus. And it just sort of incrementally stumbled into this world changing thing. And I was really very fortunate to have had that time, which of course, we, we, if you really look at it, right? I mean, we know this to be true, not that he didn't work his tail off and wasn't brilliant, but there's an enormous amount of serendipity and, and, and luck that results in anyone's success. And it, it always strikes me as a, it's somewhat of a disservice to humanity that there's not more awareness of this. Absolutely. Every single day, um, these days, really every single day, especially given where we are in the world right now, um, I just think how lucky I am and how fortunate I am. And whenever I start feeling sorry for myself, oh, you know, poor me, I don't get to do this. I don't get to do that. I say, wait, you are so ridiculously lucky. Like, look at what you are, look at what you have and look at all the things that you really can take zero credit for. I mean, sure, I worked hard. But so many people worked just as hard and didn't get to where I went. Sure. I got so lucky. Let's. I went to Harvard. That opened a lot of doors. Sh yeah, okay, I was valedictorian of my class, but everyone on the admissions committee must have been having a good day too, where they yeah. didn't uh, just suddenly dismiss me because someone didn't like my admissions essay and someone else was just very sick having a migraine. I opened the book with me having a migraine. I have issues having with yeah. migraines. And believe me, if I'm in the midst of having a migraine, I'm gonna judge things a lot more harshly than I otherwise would. I mean, how lucky was I that every everything went smoothly and that I actually got in. I could have very easily not. Lots of lots of people don't get in who probably deserve it more than I do. How lucky was I, you know, to get some of these breaks that I've gotten? I mean, all of the things have to align. And yes, you have to put yourself in that position. You have to put yourself in the position as poker teaches you to get lucky. But then whether or not you actually get lucky, whether the variance is on your side or not, is not up to you. And that's so true of almost everything in life. We can take credit for the process, for thinking well, for thinking clearly, for how we act, for how we react, for our, how we control ourselves, how we how we actually are towards other people, what kind of people we are. We can take credit for that, but we can't take credit for the outcomes. We can't actually take credit for the success because for that, other things also had to align. So I can say I'm a good decision maker, for instance. Yeah. That's something that I can take credit for. I can, and I, I actually would not say that about myself because I know that I have lots of things to, to work on, but I could say that, for instance, but I can't say that I always, you know, my decisions always result in a great outcome because that would just be patently false. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it strikes me that um, the, um, the, the poker life comparisons, which we'll, we'll talk about more in the course of this conversation, map surprisingly well. But of course, there are some areas where they don't map quite perfectly, which I think is they're important to point out. One for me is the idea that probability has amnesia, which is a great, a great line, and I love this, and it's something we all need to learn and relearn, right? That basically, um, the probability that a coin toss will land heads or tails is not affected by the fact that the last 10 uh, tosses were heads, right? I mean, it, it, it's always the same probability. But it strikes me that in life, success begets success to some degree, and, and to a degree that's unfair, right? So, so for instance, like, for, for one reason, because, uh, because success results in a lot of advantageous relationships, right? So, I mean, now that like this book of yours has done phenomenally well, it's opened, uh, I mean, just the fact that you, you know, performed as well as you did as a professional poker player, th this will make your subsequent books much easier to sell. Uh, you know, you know, the, the future Eric Seidel is much more receptive. I, I benefited from that in my own life with building businesses, you know, um, that there's a, um, you know, that if you successfully build and sell companies, investors want to give you money to build and sell the next company with the assumption that, um, oh, somebody who's successful is always going to be successful. Well, to some degree, that, that um, is uh, a self-perpetuating um, dynamic, a self-fulfilling prophecy because, because you know, uh, you know, people, because people believe that successful people will always be successful, it causes this to be more true, right? 
Um, whereas that's, that's not true with the shuffle of the deck, if you follow me. Yes and no. So I completely agree with you. And I think that in life, it is definitely the case. And this is this comes from the fact that we tend to conflate outcome with process. So we think that someone who's successful is good. And they did well. But I mean, talk to Danny Kahneman. The first place we look at is hedge fund managers, right? There's no correlation between uh, success of the past and the future most of the time. And yet, if you got really, really lucky, if you happen to, you know, launch at a good time and you had great returns for a few years, you'll be able to raise money over and over, even if you then end up tanking their people, their actual people I have in mind, this Mm -hmm. public information this has happened multiple times. They've been able to yeah. raise multiple hedge funds, even though they've lost money in all but the first one. Yeah. But people still will take that su- initial success and right, say, right, right. wow, that's actually, that's what we should be judging them on. And yes, you get more opportunities. You open more doors. The reason I say that in poker, there's actually yes and no. The cards won't change but how people respond to you, which is this exact same phenomenon, is going to change. So if you're someone who's gotten very lucky and who's actually been winning a lot, people might be scared of you because people are irrational and they'll say, oh, he's on a roll. I shouldn't shouldn't get in her way. I, you know, okay, I'm just going to fold. She must have it because she's running hot right now. And so you start winning more because you're already winning and people will actually just pave the way for you. And so in in a way, what we're seeing is that the probabilities don't change, but people's reactions to you change. So yes, the cards aren't suddenly reshuffled. The deck doesn't change, but how people perceive you has changed. So the perception of a hot hand results in a hot hand effectively. Exactly. Because, and you also feel more confident. So you're playing in a more confident way. So whenever you, whenever you're actually in a situation where you where there is skill involved as well and where people are involved where people's perceptions are involved then you can actually capitalize this and amplify so to speak your your luck that's right yeah there are these they're they're they're, vir- they're they're clearly virtuous cycles of confidence and vicious cycles of confidence in life which is part of the you know part of the challenge and you saw that in your in your in your poker journey 